So if you're looking at stained glass windows in, say, some European cathedral, you'll know the difference between who they're talking about when you see these figures. One is a man, just a human being, a person. That's the Gospel of Mark because Jesus is presented in the Gospel of Mark as being most human. The lion stands for Matthew because the Gospel of Matthew shows Jesus as the Messiah, the Jewish Messiah, and so he is the lion of the tribe of Judah. The ox stands for Luke because Luke's Gospel shows Jesus like an ox, the universal sacrifice and servant of all humanity. The eagle is for the fourth gospel, John's gospel, because it was believed that the eagle is the only creature that could look directly at the sun and not be blinded. So John's gospel is like the eagle because it looks deeply into the heart of Jesus, the word become flesh, and leaves the reader illuminated but not blinded. And we've just heard the prologue to John's gospel. What's, what's a prologue? Well, we'll think this. A long time ago in a galaxy far, far away, and then all the other words that go up on the screen. That's a prologue. Okay, something before. Maybe you see, anybody see the, the latest, greatest edition? Not that many of you. That's sort of shocking surprise. John's prologue is easily recognizable. And, and perhaps well-known among folks who were Bible readers, for in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And you can probably go on quite a few verses in your memory with it. I've spoken to ideas of the prologue of John's Gospel through Christmas. You can hardly avoid ideas from the prologue when you're talking about the Christmas story, about how the Word becomes flesh, how God is with us about the incarnation, Jesus embodying the fullness of God. Now, at Christmas time, we hear snippets of stories from various Gospels that help us put together the whole Christmas story. We hear about the star and the wise men from Matthew's Gospel, the classic story of the shepherds, the angel, the stable, the inn, found only in Luke. But we hear the cosmic Christmas story in John 1 flying directly to the sun to illumine us, illuminate us so that we'd understand that Jesus, uh, who Jesus is and what he's come to accomplish. Now, we tend to focus an awful lot as Christians on what the Bible says and not always so much on what particular parts of the Bible are meant to do. There's a lot that John 1 to 18, that portion I read today called the prologue, says. Clearly, kind of exhaustively, you can hardly unpack it. I could preach 50 sermons on the ideas that are floating through this very dense and poetic text. Today, I'd like to think a little bit about what a prologue does. What's the reason for a long time ago in a galaxy far, far away? Think about that. How does the prologue of John's gospel function? Well, it's meant to orient us, right? I mean, you can't just start off with a star cruiser flying through the stars without knowing a little bit about why they're going where they're going. And that's what Star Wars employs, and that's what John employs. It orients us, it introduces us, it grounds us, it provides some sort of perspective to look at the story. It's a default position, if you will. It's kind of a setting a tone or a direction, themes that we should expect to see throughout the next story a lens through which we would view the world. That's the reason for a prologue. I wonder if perhaps, I've said this in other ways, if we shouldn't have a prologue for our life. Our believing, maybe. A prologue for our discipleship. A prologue for our relationship with God. In fact, I believe that the entire idea of the prologue in John's Gospel is telling us not only who God is, but grounding us in what God is going to do for us. What God is making of us. When God moves into the neighborhood, what does that mean for you and for me? What does it mean for all of creation? What does it mean for humanity? We hear it in our prologue. But to all who received him, who believed in his name, he gave the power to become the children of God, who were born not of blood or of the will of the flesh or of the will of man, but were born of God. 
We need a prologue to ground us in our lives. All who received him, who believed in his name, are given power to become the children of God, born of God. Not in a galaxy a long time ago, not in a galaxy far, far away, but right here and right now, we become God's children. It's the ground of who we are, what we're about. Alistair McGrath, who teaches uh, science and, and faith at Oxford, uh, wrote this. In the end, only God can satisfy all, all desires he's basically getting at, precisely because we're made to relate to God and luxuriate in God's presence. Now, there's a fascinating understanding, isn't it? To luxuriate in God's presence. It's a beautiful image, isn't it? The spiritual journey is in one part pleasuring in, bathing, jacuzziing, if you will, luxuriating in the love of God in Christ. That's the prologue for your life. So, so first, Christmas is prologue. It's not the end. I know lots of us act as if Christmas is sort of the end of the story. Maybe we'll see you at uh, Easter, but you know, there's a whole lot more that's coming. It's only prologue. It's just the beginning words. It's not only what God has done in Christ, but it's also what God has done in us. God's love for you in Christ in the prologue that ought to play in our minds every morning. You, you have things playing in your mind every morning, right? We, most of us walk through life pretty mindless. Now, I know you don't feel like you're mindless um, because your mind is constantly telling you all kinds of things, isn't it? How many of you have the committee in your head and they regularly meet and they usually veto everything good about you? I'm the only one. A couple of chuckles, maybe. maybe. We, we all have that idea in our... You know why? Those are the prologue voices. You need new prologue voices. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And the Word gave us power to become the children of God, and that's who you are. That's the prologue of our life, and that's the prologue that should play every morning when our eyes begin to open and the screen appears for us is that the Word became flesh and dwelt among us full of grace and truth, and He has given us grace upon grace, and we are children of God. That's the ground of your being. There's no other place to start. There's no other committee to listen to other than the committee of the Father, Son, and Spirit who have grounded you in a reality that is greater than any condemnation that you can find in the prologue of your mind. It's a moment of bliss, a moment to luxuriate in the pleasure of God's affection. Can you imagine it? I, I challenge you to make it a resolution to at least try to have that prologue play every once in a while in your life, to luxuriate in God's affection. And then something else happened this year as I was reading the prologue. Is I kept reading the poetry, and it, that, that's the part that's easy to memorize, but then you arrive at this weird part that's sort of like... Mm, sort of hits the brakes on you, and it's that part about John it inter it, that's introducing this guy named John the Witness, who the poetry drops off. Some, some commentator says it's an interloping that's late, later in addition in it, and so it kind of breaks up, and you can kind of see how the poetry works, and then it splits, and then it picks up back again. You could probably hear it in what I was talking about, that the light's coming in the world, and then it makes pains to say that he's not the word. It makes pains to say he's not the light. He's come only as a witness. He's the star witness. One of, one of my most nail-biting movies for me is The Untouchables. It's a little bit older. I'm not going to ask who's seen it because I know everybody under 30 isn't, has not seen it probably. The Untouchables is a story of Elliot and Ness who's trying to nail Al Capone. And Al Capone is always one step ahead of him until Elliot and Ness begins to realize that there's only one person that can really put him away. You remember who it was? It was the bookkeeper. He was this little mousy sort of terribly stereotypic of what you might think of as an accountant in the worst possible ways. My brother's an accountant, looks nothing like that, but in case you're recording it, Terry, and he happens to be watching it. The climactic scene, though, is, remember in this train station, the whole baby down the, the thing and all that? Yeah. So there's this, this, this exciting thing. The mob is trying to get the bookkeeper out of town, and Elliot Ness and his team, the Untouchables, are trying to keep him from going so that they can capture the star witness, and it ends sort of in this wild gunfight in the, the train station over one lowly bookkeeper. What's important about the bookkeeper? He's the star witness. 
the one person whose testimony can send Al Capone to prison and change his life forever. A star witness is the one witness for either side of the case that can literally determine the outcome. John the witness is that star witness in John's gospel. Now, do you know who John the witness actually is? Other gospels call him something else. John the Baptist. You ever notice that, and I didn't, I didn't look at this until this year, they never call John the Baptist John the Baptist in John's gospel. It's only John the witness. Notice it as you read the gospel. In the other gospels, he's called John the Baptist, but in John the gospel, he's only called John the witness. That struck me. Why such an important figure and forerunner, the idea of being a forerunner, maybe the, the old Elijah come back in John the Baptist in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, sheds all that understanding to become John the witness, John the star witness. And then I begin to think, if that's so important, then what's he trying to get at, John's gospel, trying to get at in terms of what we are to witness, what he's talking about when he says, Behold the Lamb of God who comes to take away the sin of the world. That's what John the witness says in John's gospel. We need to think then maybe that Christmas is less about a holiday of, of shopping and gift giving and perhaps more an opportunity to witness the dawning of light. The presence of John the witness here suggests there's a, a critical response to, to Christmas as witness. We have it all around us, don't we? We hear it played through Muzak, through the malls. I, I always find it fascinating when O Come, O Come, Emmanuel comes on in like Nordstrom, you know, and it's all about the underlings arising and, you know, in Nordstrom. I, I worked for Nordstrom, I love Nordstrom, nothing bad about Nordstrom, but it's sort of this double ring about the, the impoverished riving, rising, the ransoming of a captive Israel in the midst of a society that has no idea what we're saying or singing as we sing these revolutionary words. That Christmas is a witness to what God is doing in Christ. Christmas is just getting started for those of us who confess Jesus as God who has become flesh, a radical relocation of where we find God in the universe is God in our lives. What, what do witnesses do? They, they witness, of course, to things that they themselves have seen. Now, if you've ever been a witness, they really don't like it when you start interpreting what you've seen. They don't, they don't really want to hear that. If you've ever been interviewed by a police officer, what'd you see? They don't, when you get an interpretation, you get the cold shoulder. All they want is the facts and nothing but the facts. Anybody remember who said that? Friday. Okay. Um, another dating myself. Anybody? <laughs> Under 40, I won't get that one. Uh, I, I think it's a good reminder for us as, as witnessing in a postmodern world. Millennials, it says, aren't so interested in truths as they are in experience. So our, our witness probably should move away from the propositional type of truth-telling that the church has been in the modern era so good at. You know, the four spiritual steps and the sinner's prayer and you're in sort of idea, and move instead to a personal relational or personal experiential type of understanding. That is, that is moving away from accept this truth to experience this reality. Many people, maybe you're one of them, especially if you're on Facebook, are tired of Christians saying that it's all about love, and then you experience them in a forum like that, and you see that Christians have such contempt for others. Now, we like to hide behind a phrase. You know the phrase. Love the sinner. Hate the sin. How, how good are you at that? I, I'm a miserable failure at that. I and mean, we hide behind that idea, this propositional truth of loving the sinner but hating the sin, but I can't help but have some contempt ease in on me about the ones who are making such bad decisions. Jesus did not say, now we often quote to one another as if it's Jesus' truth, love the sinner, hate the sin. It's not that. Jesus said, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. I would think that's even harder than that. 
You want to see what a star witness looks like. We look to some of the saints. We continue to commemorate saints. You know, a lot of the Catholic saints are our saints because of the quality characteristic that is being brought up in there. But we have other saints like Corrie ten Boom and her family who broke the law to protect human life from those who would harm them. What if we as church, what if you as a believer were known for your kindness to the marginalized and discriminated against by the world? What if we were known for that? Or look at somebody like Mother Teresa. Now, I know that's kind of a high bar. Who loved and cared for people who, too often, you and I wouldn't touch with a 10-foot pole. What if we were known for our compassion for the poor and the downtrodden? And that that would take place instead of our fabulous worship concerts and massive cathedrals. Look at Maximilian Kolbe. It's one of the names of the the Catholic churches in town, who voluntarily gave his life in Nazi Germany for another man who had been selected for death. What if we were radically committed to life? Now, now, you got to hear this in a bigger way than what's normally meant. Not just for the unborn, but for them, but for every life. And that we saw our mission not to protect our own lives, but to offer them as a sacrifice for greater life. Maybe Christ would be a brighter light in the world than he seems to appear now with followers who are more committed to being members of the church than being disciples of Jesus. Maybe Christianity would be freed from being an institution sort of thing to being the liberation movement of the Savior that it was intended to be all along. Let's resolve to let others see the love of Jesus, not in the truths that we say, but in the truth of our actions, Christmas is more than the birth of a baby in a manger. It's the prologue of God's handiwork in our life's story, seeding us, founding us, grounding us in the luxurious love of God. Christmas is more than just getting gifts and celebrating a holiday and lifting a Yule log whatever that is. Christmas is about being a witness to light, presence, even in a dark world. And so every Christian is a star witness for Christ in our world. How's your witness? How's your Christmas? How's your prologue and luxuriating in the love of God. Let's resolve in this new year to move forward in those things for the sake of the light that will not be put out in our world, the light of the love of God. Amen.